Ontario's financial accountability uh, accountability officer <laughs> provides the Ontario legislature with independent analysis on the state of the province's finances and trends in the provincial economy, as well as on bills and other proposals to support the legislature's performance of its constitutional responsibility. The Financial Accountability Officer is an independent officer of the Legislative Assembly, does not report to the cabinet. There are similarities between the role and function of the Financial Accountability Officer and the Auditor General. Both are independent officers of the legislature and they provide financial analysis to members of the legislature. But there are important differences, which I'm sure our speaker will be covering today. Peter Weltman was appointed to Ontario's, as Ontario's second financial accountability officer in May of 1918. He has extensive experience working at the Parliamentary Budget Office in Ottawa, serving as Director of Executive Services, Communication and Parliamentary Relations to the, to the Parliamentary Budget Officer. He also served as past president, president of the Canadian chapter of the International Cost Estimating and Analysis Association. Before working at the Parliamentary Budget Office in Ottawa, Mr. Weltman worked as a, in different capacities for Industry Canada, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, Human Resources and Skills Development Canada, and the Treasury Board Secretariat. Gentlemen, I'm pleased to introduce our guest speaker, Peter Weltman. Thank you. <clears throat> Boy, that intro makes me sound like I'm a lifelong public servant, which isn't entirely true. I have a much more checkered career past than that. So I did spend some time in the family business here in Ottawa for a long time, and then uh, was in financial services as well. So it's going to be an interesting perspective uh, on the work that I do. I'm going to run through what the office does. I mean, I think mean, Art's covered a lot of that already. <clears throat> I'll add a few little nuances. I'm then gonna just show you examples of some of the work that we do and the way that that actually can add some value in, in, the, in the system to MPPs when they're looking at scrutinizing budgets, fiscal plans, et cetera. <clears throat> Please feel free to ask questions at any point. Part of my objective is to elicit as many questions as I can. I, don't, I have a lot of material. I am under no obligation to have to get through all of it. Um, so it's entirely, uh, you know, we'll, we'll keep it fairly, fairly free, free flowing. Now we can get this thing to work. <clears throat> Let's go the other way. There we go. So I love starting off with this slide. It's a bit of a history lesson for folks who did, you know, some of this stuff. And it shows who the history nerds are and who they aren't. <clears throat> so really, this is an old picture, a picture of running meat on the right yet. Excuse me, King John. On the left, you have the knights, etc., representing Parliament and the signing of the Magna Carta. And what I use this slide for is to explain to people we support the folks on the left of the screen here. So we support the Parliament as they scrutinize the Crown or the government's ask for public funds and public revenues. So in our system of government, uh, Parliament or in our case in Ontario, the legislature needs to give its legal authority for the government to raise public funds and to spend them. So what we do is provide analysis to the MPPs. I'll figure this out. So there we go. Motto in the office and my motto, because <clears throat> I do a lot of media, uh, shed light, not heat. Our objective isn't to be part of the story. Our objective is to provide MPPs with information analysis so they can use that to hold the government to account. It's not my job to hold the government to account. That's not what the law says. <clears throat> As Art mentioned, it's modeled on the PBO in Ottawa. Well, I was there for almost nine years, almost since the beginning. Uh, so that was a terrific experience and certainly prepared me well for this role here. Um, I am an independent officer of the legislature, like the Auditor General, like the Chief Electoral Officer, like the Ethics Commissioner, et cetera which means that I report to Parliament. The difference between my role and the Auditor General is that we provide forecasts. <clears throat> so when we're doing a cost estimate of a healthcare program or of 
surgery backlogs or uh, what the budget deficit will look like over the next five years. We're always looking forward. The Auditor General is doing audits. So she's looking backwards. She's looking as to what happened and was that in compliance with the law and were some of those programs delivered, um, you know, relative to best practices and how effective they were. So very different, uh, different roles, but important to have both together. Uh, we work in four really different areas, main areas. We look at Ontario's economy. We look at the government's fiscal position, basically surplus deficit. We look at sectoral spending plans. <clears throat> so we've done a lot of work in healthcare. We've done a lot of work in education because those are the two biggest programs in Ontario. And um, we also look at specific programs. So we looked at the homelessness program. We look, we've looked at a bunch of things. I'm just throwing off some examples and I'll show you as we go through. We've looked at a piece on uh, infrastructure backlog, climate change impacts. We've done work on, as I mentioned before, surgery backlogs as a result of shutdowns, as a result of COVID. So we have a bunch of work uh, out there. Everything is, is available on our website. Everything we do is public. Everything we publish is public. That's just the nature of the way we, we run. Uh, I'm going to run through some quick uh, examples of our work and why they're important. As I said before, if you have any questions, just feel free to ask. I'll tell you right off the bat, <clears throat> these next few slides are out of date. I mean, these are budget forecasts we did last year. And because of COVID, the economy and economic forecasting has been all over the map. It's been, uh, I mean, a very unusual time, as I'm sure we all are quite familiar with at this point, being two years into it. So we do, um, twice a year, we do an assessment of the government's fiscal plan. Uh, we do one after the government presents its budget in the spring, and we do another one after the government presents its fall update in the fall. So we'll have an, uh, our update coming out in about three weeks, which we'll comment on and we'll, we'll provide independent analysis to MPPs of uh, the government's fiscal outlook uh, that they presented back in, uh, back in November. <clears throat> uh, we use our own modeling. We have our own staff, many of whom came over from the Ministry of Finance. So we have pretty good expertise. In fact, we have terrific expertise in modeling the uh, fiscal position of the Ontario government, probably uh, second to the Ministry of Finances in terms of just the capacity. Um, so what we do is we'll show you, for example, in this, in this outlook from last year's budget, where we were projecting that the budget deficit would be uh, better or the fiscal position would be better than what the government was projecting. Um, unusual because we are making different assumptions on revenue and on spending. And that's, you know, in and of itself is important because it gives people another data point to, to have another look and ask questions about the government's budget. And a couple of interesting little things I'll show you in this next slide. Come on. <clears throat> so one of the things that came out in the, uh, in the budget and then the fall update the previous year, and these are sorts of things we can tease out because we do our own modeling, is um, when the government did a revenue forecast, you'll see the government's line of the 2021 budget in red. Our revenue forecast is in blue, and there's a difference, right? There's a difference of 1.4 billion in 2022, 23, $2.2 billion difference of uh, the next out year. <clears throat> and what this represents is an assumed tax cut. Uh, we're assuming that the government's revenue projection is lower because there's going to be some kind of change made to tax rules. And the reason we're able to ascertain that is because revenues grow reasonably, predictably with the economy, with employment, with wage growth and that sort of thing. So once that relationship starts to diverge, then you know something else is going on. And these are the sorts of things that we will tease out to provide to MPPs and let them ask the questions as to what's happening. And that there is some of the value add of having an independent budget office that works for the legislature. That's not something the government's going to put in. I mean, they, they, they sort of projected for it. They put it in their numbers, but they didn't put it in the text of the budget because they probably weren't ready yet to announce a tax cut. And if I was a government and I knew an election was coming up, I'd probably wait, you know, until the election was closer before I announced something like that. That's my speculation. And I'm going the wrong way again. There we go. <clears throat> We did a long-term piece too, in terms of when we thought the government would balance. 
And you'll see here we have something called a recovery plan. That's the government's own terminology in terms of they're required by their own law to show when they're going to balance the budget if they can't balance it in, in the first few years here. Uh, our projection back then was they weren't going to balance largely because they would have to keep spending growth uh, well below trend uh, on a regular basis. While not impossible, uh, hasn't been done to this degree. So keeping spending growth to 1.5% a year um, sounds interesting, except if you think about healthcare, for example, healthcare grows at about 3.8% per year, largely because you have an aging population <clears throat> You have a growing population, and also it's aging. You have healthcare inflation. So inflation on healthcare products and services tends to exceed the consumer price index. Of course, the next, you know, these last couple of years, that's all gone out the window in terms of the CPI, but that's what the normal situation looks like. <clears throat> so to get your health, keep your health spare, healthcare spending at one and a half percent, when it normally grows at three, eight means you have to be either making cuts which will maybe manifest themselves in service levels, or you're doing some terrific re-engineering and you're able to completely overhaul how you deliver these services, you're doing it for far less money than you were before. So, you know, from my point of view, uh, sounds great. If you're planning to deliver the same level of service for a whole lot less money, it'd be, you know, if I were an MPP, I'd kind of say, well, you know, let me see the plan. Let me see how you're planning to do that before you come and ask me for, for approval on your spending. So that's the purpose behind the analysis that we did here. We did a piece a year and a half ago on surgical backlogs. <clears throat> we did, uh, this was a very popular piece for good reason. Uh, obviously it's out of date right now. What we did is we looked at the rate of the pace of surgeries pre and post and, and during COVID, we looked at the rate of surgeries and diagnostics procedures uh, during the lockdowns and we sort of applied that going forward. And that's why we came up with some of these numbers. Um, <clears throat> and why we do this, again, it's not because we are, you know, trying to be critical of the government or, you know, support the government or whatever the case is. This, just these are what the numbers are. And you can, you know, you have to realize this is reality. <clears throat> I'm sure all of us know people who have been affected by this to some degree. The numbers are worse now than these numbers show. And these are going to have to be addressed in some way, shape or form. Luckily, I don't have to come up with a solution as to how to address that. I wasn't elected to do that job, but I get to point out what the consequences are of current policy. Oh, it's a cute little, yeah. Bottom line, that's what they, that's what they got to do in some way, shape, or form. <clears throat> We're going to diverge into a few specific program areas that we look at, just to give you an example of some of the analysis that we do. Again, if you have any questions along the way, feel free to shoot me a chat or put your hand up or yell out or whatever works for you. Uh, we're seeing after some period of restraint uh, 10, 15 years ago, we're gonna see some fairly significant growth in long-term care spending, which on its face, <clears throat> given what we've been through with COVID and the disaster that we've had in long-term care and the impact there uh, looks reassuring, uh, but let's put those numbers into context <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we still aren't going to keep, um, you know, keep popular. We're, we're still going to be having a hard time uh, getting enough beds out there for the growing population. So, the, and the way you do this analysis is that um, the largest population, if you will, of folks in long term care are age 75 and over. So at a certain point in time, once your population hits 75 years old, you know a certain percentage of those are going to be in care. And that percentage goes up dramatically at 85. So you have, you know, you can do some demographic projections to figure out roughly how many folks you're going to have needing long-term care at any one point in time as the population ages. Um, so what we see here is that... Um, you know, the, from 2018 to 2029, the population of Ontarians age 75 and over will increase by 52%, but the number of long-term care beds will increase by 38%. So while there's a ton of new spending happening in long-term care, it will not be enough to provide beds for folks who are going, you know, 
for all folks, we're going to need them going forward. And what that allows is it's not a, well, should the government spend, shouldn't the government spend more money? Well, sure, that may be one way to do it, but it also forces a conversation around, are there other ways to look after our folks who need this sort of nursing care, apart from putting them into a long-term care home? Are there other ways to do that that maybe are get better outcomes? I mean, better is always a subjective subjective word as somebody whose father just, my father just passed away about three weeks ago in a long-term care bed. <clears throat> I know better outcome. I'm not sure what that looks like, uh, but certainly, uh, you know, on the way to getting to that point, maybe there are better ways to do it. Um, so it does force a conversation. That's what I like about doing this kind of work is it forces a discussion to start to think a little bit about when somebody says, well, we can't afford that. And somebody else says, yeah, but that's the way the program is set up. Those people are going to get older. They're going to require it. They're going to require the care. You know, you can pretend it's not going to happen or you can get on with it and do something about it. Online again. <clears throat> we did a bunch of work on COVID spending. We we're the only organization in the country to actually be able to do this um, in, in non governmental organization where we looked at. We, so, this is just a snapshot of a bunch of reports that we've done. And we looked at how much money was spent because of COVID in Ontario, <clears throat> sorry, and federally and where the money went and the change in, uh, in spending over the course since September of 2020. So that's been a really useful piece of work for MPPs who are asking, you know, holding the government account, are you looking after businesses? Are you looking after schools? How are you looking after healthcare? The downside of all this though, is that it assumes that because the government is, you know, spending money or not spending money, means that it's doing something. Now, in this case, it's probably a reasonable approximation, but it's not always not always the case. And sometimes you'll see criticism of the government for not spending money that they have. And somebody says, well, that means that the government's not doing anything in the space. And I'm not sure that's entirely a fair assessment, but governments on their, you know, to, to, to their side, always like to tout how much money they're spending on something as a proxy for, for action, so. This is an interesting chart because it tells you where the new money was coming from. And what it does is it also explains why our budget forecast, our deficit forecast is better than the government's because <clears throat> we have been able to show that 20% of the new COVID spending has been found by reallocating existing spending uh, from other government, federal, uh, provincial government programs. We also show that 28% of the money is coming from the feds. So this reallocation isn't cuts necessarily. It could be things, for example, like in 2020, uh, physician visits dropped off, dropped off a cliff. People stopped going to the doctor for a whole bunch of good reasons and uh, virtual care or you know telemedicine wasn't up and running yet. So oh, hit billings by physicians went way down. So the money that the government had set aside for those OHIP buildings <clears throat> got reallocated to, for example, buying more PPE, uh, training more healthcare workers, et cetera. So that's what some of this 20% would represent. And we've been able to sort of show that again, it's pretty useful information for citizens as well as MPPs to find out you know, where the money came from. So the debt situation was feared to be much worse uh, than it's going to turn out to be because there were a lot of funds that weren't spent that would normally have been spent. Get this right. I did. <clears throat> Moving along to something totally different. We did a piece on home energy spending. Um, I'm having trouble seeing my screens. Let's get this far I can. There we are. Um, huge issue in Ontario, home energy, electricity. When I was in Ottawa, we were doing work on... Um, on climate change, on impacts of climate change, and the whole electricity thing was coming to a head before the 2018 election. And I remember working with a colleague and we were looking at it thinking, you know, electricity in Ontario is, is relatively cheap relative to the Southern states. The only reason it looks expensive is because relative to Quebec and Manitoba who both get most of their electricity from hydro. Uh, yeah, electricity looks expensive. <clears throat> um, but was a big political issue. And every time we do something with electricity in the title, it gets a lot of coverage. Um, this is an interesting chart from that um, 
from that report. And it sort of shows that because the energy subsidy, and that's what this is, uh, is largely tied to how much energy you use, the higher quintile uh, income levels, the fourth and fifth quintile, uh, spend the least amount of money relative to their incomes on energy, 1.2%, yet in absolute terms are getting the highest subsidies. So this is important because, and obviously the opposite is true here, which is, which is useful, and because they're spending um, more of their money, 4.6% of their income, the lowest quintile, and they're getting the least amount of money in terms of a, as a subsidy, but you would expect that because their consumption is not as high. <clears throat> but what it does allow is an MPP to say, hey, you know, does this make sense? Does this make sense? Should not some of this money be moved over across the year? I'm not saying it should or it shouldn't, but we're putting that out there to enable that discussion. Um, this is also an interesting piece too, because it breaks out all the different subsidy, electricity subsidy programs, shows you that the cost of electricity for an average household 2019 was reduced by $609. And obviously the higher income quintile, the highest quintile of that cost was reduced uh, by $706. And the different charts, the different uh, the dark blue, the light blue, the red are the different programs. And the red one, the OESP is, is really geared for, um, for folks who are much lower income and, or have other issues in terms of getting the, uh, you know, the rural programs, getting electricity and energy out to rural areas. <clears throat> But again, it gives you a snapshot. So if you look at the $637, uh, you multiply that by how many families are in this quintile, and it shows you how much money is being spent in that, uh, in that quintile, in this quintile, in that quintile. So useful things. <clears throat> again, totally different. Moving into infrastructure. So we cover, I'll stop here for a second and let you know we have a staff of 20. Um, so my staff have been incredibly productive over the last uh, couple of years. We've been working remotely. We've always had sort of a work from home policy. We've always had, I guess, what they call a hybrid model. Um, and so not a requirement to be in the office all the time. So we've had a lot of experience in how to work remotely. We've had the software we've had. We've been using Teams since long before it became popular. Uh, we've had a lot of processes in place to make us effective and we've basically kicked out records amounts of reports in the last two years, which has been really quite something. So this was a big piece of work. We did some work on infrastructure. Um, we were asked in, uh, in 2019 to see if we could assess the impact of climate change in Ontario. We were focused on infrastructure because there were too many other areas and we just didn't have the capacity to do so. So we did a bunch of reports. One of them was, um, you know, how much infrastructure we have, how much does it cost, what does it cost to replace? Uh, then we started with that. We looked at the backlog of this infrastructure and these are reports that were released over the last couple of years. So how much money would it take to bring the buildings and infrastructure up to stuff? And then we looked at climate change and what are the impacts of climate change on the existing infra infrastructure on the assumption that you brought everything back up to stuff. <clears throat> so first piece we did on infrastructure and climate change was buildings. Ontario has $254 billion worth of buildings, hospitals, schools, water, wastewater, et cetera, courthouses, colleges, that sort of thing. So that gives you the size. And then when you look at uh, climate change impacts, then we, we, there are a whole bunch, right? So again, I've only shown you a few slides. We have uh, three reports up on the website that we put out in early December. One was the buildings report. One was a backgrounder as to how we did the work. And then the third one was by a company that we hired to help us do a lot of the engineering modeling, WSP Global, and they did their own report to us, which we posted to the website. So if you really want to get into the, to the technicalities of how we did this, all that information is there. In a nutshell, to keep it simple, climate change has been reliably modeled now. It's been at it for 30 or maybe 40 years. So we know that temperatures are getting warmer. We know that because of temperatures getting warmer, <clears throat> you're going to get more extreme heat days impacting your buildings. We also know that as the air gets warmer, it holds more water. So you're going to have more instances of extreme rainfall. We also know that as the temperatures get warmer, you're going to have fewer freeze-thaw cycles because there are going to be more warm days and there are cold days. 
So we modeled those three climate hazards. There are a whole bunch of others. There are things like wildfires and there are things like, you know, which we've seen, there are things like um, uh, fluvial or flooding as a result of um, rivers and of uh, oceans and that sort of thing, which we did not model because these weren't deemed to be the most relevant for building infrastructure. In these scenarios, you see a low, medium, and high emission scenario that is carbon emissions. So the more carbon you pump into the atmosphere, the hotter the atmosphere is going to get because it's retaining more and more heat. Um, so if you look at these three scenarios, that's why we, you know, so there are three scenarios that we've overlaid on top. And cut and dry by the time we, uh, we crunch the numbers um, over the next, by the end of this century, by the end of this decade, uh to manage um to basically maintain your infrastructure in good working order as a result of the impacts of climate change is going to add another six billion dollars to your maintenance and your deferred maintenance costs in a medium emission scenario so in a high emission scenario obviously it's a lot higher <clears throat> we projected out to 2100 you always have to be a little careful projecting out 100 years um but that's why there are these confidence intervals. That's why what these lines represent is simply a midpoint amongst a bunch of different potential scenarios. Uh, but it's, you know, it's a reasonable assumption and that's what it looks like. So, you know, it's not, I'm not certainly uh, making friends with our finance minister who has got a lot of other pressures to manage. And then I show up and the legislature of the report saying, yeah, and by the way, you got to find another $116 billion between now and the end of the decade, just to manage what you've got in the ground right now buildings. We have another report coming out on roads and transport and a third one coming out on, on water infrastructure. Those will probably get released after the election. We just don't have the bodies to get them out any sooner than that. So yeah, I'm not winning a lot of friends with these reports, but what it does is again, it adds a baseline, right? So it's like, okay, we have an idea now, grosso modo, what the impacts of climate change are going to be. We know that when the weather gets hotter, I'm going to have to run the air conditioning longer. I may need to buy a bigger air conditioner. I may need to, re to, to shore up the building envelope because there's going to be a lot more rain and if water gets inside that building um, or into the envelope or into the soil underneath, it's going to cause damage a much quicker rate than it would have in the past with the extreme, extreme uh, rainfall, et cetera. So these things will happen. And it allows a discussion around trade-offs. You can pretend it's not going to happen and hope for the best. Or you can maybe look and say, well, how do we, um, you know, how do we adapt? So we did around a few scenarios for what adaptation would cost. Um, so the dark blue is if you don't adapt, here is roughly what our estimate it is. If you reactively adapt, which means once a building comes to its end of life, you rebuild it with some resilience. Or if you go and get ahead of the curve and you spend some money now to adapt your buildings, here's what it'll cost. So again, it's a starting point. It's a discussion point. And you can see in the um, proactive adaptation is more expensive, but what that does is it gives you a portfolio of adapted buildings much earlier on in the piece um, before 2100. The other thing this doesn't include, uh, because there's no way to model it reliably, is what happens when something fails. <clears throat> so infrastructure you have maintained fails. And we saw what happened in BC when there were roads and dikes that were in need of maintenance that hadn't been maintained. You have some crazy rainstorms. That, that happened out there, um, not unusually out in BC, but but unusually for the size this time around because of climate change. And you have billions of dollars worth of damage, economy shut down, roads shut down. So we don't include this, those costs in this. This is simply assuming nothing crazy happens. You know something crazy will happen, you just aren't really able to predict it effectively. So we don't. Oh yes, the shameless self-promotion piece. So we put this up on our uh, site just to let folks know how many reports and the popular ones and you know, clearly um, um, the website reports, the popular one last year, you know, review of the COVID-19 on hospital capacity was a huge one. And um, federal provincial COVID response measures was really big as well, you know, not, not surprisingly. So one of the ones I like the most, I don't know if it's on this chart, is how many times we actually get mentioned in question period. And uh, that's been going up pretty regularly. Uh, so all these other things are nice. 
they tell me that we are getting the word out about what we do and why it's important. But when we get pensions in question period, it's because our, our direct clients or MPPs are actually using our work to ask questions, to hold the government to account. And that's ultimately what our, what our job is. And that was it. I mean, I could talk forever on a whole bunch of other things, <clears throat> but you know, I got set up it was pretty hard to compete with Abbott and Costello, especially given the nature of the material that I have to work with. So I think maybe I'll just hold off here and uh, and open it up for, for any questions, comments, and feel free to ask whatever you'd like. Um, we are under, you know, quote unquote, Chatham House rules. So I will be, I will still have to be reasonably street. It's really important that I'm perceived as being nonpartisan and I am nonpartisan, uh, but I have to be seen to be nonpartisan. And, um, you know, so with that caveat, um, happy to have answer any questions. Maya. Now, remember, if you want to ask a question, you must unmute yourself. Everybody is pretty much muted at the present time. Um, while people are gathering themselves, uh, I'll just speak first uh, as one of the listeners. And I wasn't aware of the FAO office, probably heard of it before, didn't know what they did. And I'm really impressed by what you do <laughs> and why you do it. And I'm normally not a great student of statistics, and I was fascinated by the statistics you were showing me. Uh, the question I have is, do you guys have a mailing list where I can, if I haven't checked, of course, if I go to your website, can I sign up and get notified when a new report pops up or something like that? Yeah, you can. You can, the site's all set up for that. Okay. <clears throat> the other thing we've tried to do, uh, we spend a lot of time on is not just the writing of the reports, but also finding ways to make them more accessible. So we do have, you know, presentations that are on the site that, that help to, that we use and we brief the media and we brief MPPs, we have infographics, we have little video clips. So we have lots of different uh, pieces of material that we use to try to make the report accessible. And part of those we hope MPPs decide to use and put them up on their site or just makes their job a little easier to disseminate some of this some of this information because a lot of this stuff's hard and so it's a slog and if you're not looking at it every day um it can be hard to understand and hard to make sense of you find that there's an increase in the demand for your reports as we get closer to election time it's a great question um so federally like in ottawa yeah um but Ottawa, let's be honest. So MPs are much better resourced than MPPs. They have a lot, much bigger office budgets. Um, they, um, it's a little different, a little different culture. So yeah, there's a huge demand, especially for an election. And a lot of times it is the sort of testing policy ideas. Uh, I expect to start to see that in Ontario. I think, um, uh, previous to 2018, I started this in 2018, and the previous uh, officer, um, they had a few growing pains getting started, so I'm not sure how much traction the FAO had. It did amongst certain circles. So this climate change piece, for example, that we were asked to do back in 20, 2019, um, the caveat was from the MPP in question, he said, can you make sure you have this ready before the next election? So there's one example. <clears throat> uh, and I just think we're starting to see a lot of getting a lot of questions about um well what if we did this and what if we did this and change this tax policy you know if, you know what if we increase spending in this area so a lot of times we have discussions with mpps and their staff kind of behind the scenes we don't necessarily write a report about it uh we help them understand what they need to do so long answer to a short question sorry for that but yeah i expect to see an increase but i don't know because um politics are a little different here so I, I, I don't know if we'll act, that'll actually materialize. Do you find that requests for your reports uh, come more from uh, opposition MPs or MPPs? Oh, always, always. But what's been good here, which wasn't the case in Ottawa, was we've done some briefings, uh, a number of briefings for PC MPPs, whether in their own offices, we actually did a presentation to the PC caucus just to help them you know, understand what it is we did and what we can be useful for. And that went over, that went over quite well. 
So yeah, generally the opposition is our is our biggest client, if you will. Uh, the other big clients are stakeholder groups. So they may be, you know, teachers unions or public public sector unions or you know construction associations, PPP associations, especially in the climate change piece, um, sometimes universities. So there are a lot of other stakeholders that that ask us about our reports, um, but we can't write reports if they ask us to write one. If an MPP, the way we do this is that we, MPPs can come to us to ask us to do stuff. Mm. And I can also decide what we will produce or not produce. Having had some background in budget offices, there are certain core reports you have to do. And then we try to keep as much room available as we can for MPP questions. I mean, the surgery backlog is a good, that was an MPP question. The about the climate change piece was an MPP question. Most of them are uh, things like the fiscal analysis, the budget analysis. Those are sort of core products that we do on a regular basis. Now, one of the things that the uh, that COVID brought to light, as far as healthcare is concerned, is the uh, extremely high cost of hospital care. And one of the differences with the American system, which we have never picked up on, is the use of surgery centers or daycare surgery in a building exclusive from a public hospital. And this shows up now with the tremendous backlog and things that we've taken for granted. Um, mammography, breast biopsies, colonoscopies, recheck endoscopies for recurrent cancers. All these things which are not extremely difficult, tedious procedures that need hospital care uh, have been shelved. And you've got hundreds and thousands of people now whose care has been compromised because we were not ready. We were not prepared. And I know that it's, uh, some people regard these comments would be as sour grapes, but the system has shown its faults and uh, we can learn a lot from it. But I was just wondering, Peter, if your organization had done any studies on the use of uh, day surgery or uh, doing these procedures exclusive of a hospital where the overhead is so high that we've had to cancel everything. Um, I think we could learn something from this. Oh, I 100% I agree. We, if I had twice as many people, I would take half of them and put them, like if I have 20 staff now, if I had another 20, I'd have them only doing healthcare because there's so much there to do. We did a piece on hospital capacity back in May of 2020, just as the outbreak started. And we assessed uh, how many beds and we assessed how many um, um, emergency beds. I can't remember the exact term. <clears throat> uh, when we did our long-term care piece, we also showed how many people were sitting in alternative level of care, ALC rooms and taking up space in hospitals. So we haven't specifically gotten to the question that you mentioned. We've sort of gotten around it. We sort of had a higher level, bigger picture. You know, yeah. We run, up until the pandemic, our hospitals were... Uh, I think it was between 90 and 96% capacity, which was the second highest in the OECD. So already before the pandemic, we showed in our report that we were running thin, way thin <clears throat> relative to all of our OECD peers. Um, and I think, you know, we did the surgery piece, uh, which was a specific question. We got into something very specific. Um, I'd love to get into you know, a lot more of the questions that you that you mentioned. So we will, if an MPP asks us, um, and, and, and but it, always, I mean, it has to be phrased a certain way. It can't be an audit, right? Because that's the AG's job. It's got to be okay. If we, you know, can, I'm going to put a bill forward. We're going to um, we're going to create these out centers, these surgery out centers, whatever you want to call them. It's going to cost, you know, X. Can you give me a forecast as to what? that cost will be going forward and what do you think the savings will be relative to the current program, we could probably do that sort of work. Yes. Another simple example of that, just briefly, is that in the American system, I know this from being a urology here in St. Catharines, we used to belong to the Buffalo Urologic Society. And we would periodically go to Buffalo to meet with our colleagues and discuss various issues of common uh, interest. One of the things that came up is the, the amount of work that they did in their offices minor surgical procedures that we could not do in Ontario. They had to be done in the hospital. And the overhead was enormous. I would go in there and have the luxury of having two nurses, uh, beautiful equipment, uh, great lighting, heat, beautiful building. And this could have easily been done much lower cost in my office. 
uh, either through uh, OHIP billings or a small add-on fee, which the surgeon would charge. And this was done successfully in the States for many, many years and to this day is being done. And yet in Canada, through the Canada Health Act, we are not allowed to do that. And I think that a hybrid model of private and public care will eventually have to be accepted as the more efficient way to produce health care. So that may come out yeah. of this COVID thing. I think it, I think I'll some of that will, but you know, an observation on that is that when I was at Ottawa and I was running this chat, this cost estimating chapter, it was an American organization. I was in the States a lot. And my joke was, <clears throat> I won't talk to you about guns. Don't talk to me about healthcare. <laughs> Cause it was, it's culturally embedded. And, yes. um, you know, we don't have relative to our OECD partners, we have pretty high costs and pretty crummy outcomes on overall in our health system. I've been looking at things like scope, job scope. <clears throat> you know, to your point, why are you doing urology in a fancy hospital, two nurses? Um, another friend of mine's a doc, and he was saying that uh, in some parts, some of the health uh, MHMOs in the States, they'll have folks who, uh, who aren't doctors, who aren't uh, anesthetists, but they're doing some kind of particular procedure and I don't remember what it is and they do these dozens of times a day and you know they're paid accordingly and they're very good at it whereas a doctor in Canada might do this sort of thing once or twice you know a month so won't have the same level of experience and cost a lot more to do it so there are a lot of a lot of things within the system that you know again if I had the resources I'd love to go after but we'll see how it goes and I think that I think you're right I think a lot of what's happened the failings of our system to manage and the forces to shut down an enormous cost to the to the economy and the treasury and mental health starts to give you a baseline as to you know for a cost benefit analysis right okay well do we want to increase capacity or do we want to suffer another shutdown and people will go well now we know what a shutdown looks like and feels like maybe we're more willing to consider alternatives to that than maybe we were in the past that's that's yeah. kind of my hope anyway curious but i see that your uh, your office is approximately six years old here in ontario are there comparable offices in other Canadian provinces? And what about at the federal level? So there is a federal a parliamentary budget office, okay. which was started in uh, 2008, <clears throat> 2009, I believe. Uh, and we're modeled off of that. Okay. So there are organizations around the world. There's actually an OECD. They have all kinds of fancy bureaucratic names for their groups. But I think it's called the Senior working party of budget offices or whatever, I don't remember, but there are 30 or so of these things. Um, there are two other subnational offices, one, two of them, both of them in Australia. So Scotland has one, but I think depending on your point of view, is that a subnational government or not? It was created in Scotland, for example, because of the devolution of responsibilities, financial responsibilities to Scotland. That deal that was struck in 2010, the corollary was the British government wanted an independent budget office there to add another level of, of accountability and assurance. And that's often how these things get created. I mean, my office <clears throat> was created as part of a political deal uh, with the Queen minority government in 2014 as a condition of passing the budget. So that was something the NDP wanted. In Ottawa, it was the same thing. When the Conservatives were campaigning, they promised they'd put in an accountability officer because they didn't trust the government's numbers and they wanted a, an, an office to, to a budget office to provide independent analysis. So that's often how these things get created. Um, in other European countries, many of these offices are the ones that actually do the fiscal forecasting for the government. So they're sort of quasi-independent from the government. Um, yeah, but like I said, they're about 30 or so of us. Uh, similar mandates, but slightly different ways of being set up. Okay. Well, it makes sense that Ontario would be first because relative to the rest of the provinces in Canada, we do have the largest population and the largest economy. Yes, by a long shot. Now, Quebec has been looking at one for a while. I actually just reviewed a paper uh, for an academic at Sherbrooke about... Uh, sort of a backgrounder in terms of uh, what's going on, why these things were set up and what one might look like in Quebec. It was, it was fun because my parents were force, farsighted enough to put me in French immersion as a kid. So this paper was in French. So I had a chance to actually read it in French and comment in French and it was hopefully they weren't too put off by my French. But I think uh, there's been a strong move there to put something in place too. And uh, the political reasons I'm not entirely sure of, but 
I can guess, I'm not sure I want to guess right at this particular moment, that they may have something to do with the leanings of this particular government in Quebec. But I was in BC in the summer visiting some family <clears throat> and I saw their legislature building and I was like, oh, this is gorgeous. It's beautiful. And um, so I was checking with, checking with a friend of mine who used to work in Ottawa. And he said, I said, well, I think BC probably could, you know, need one here. I think, you know, and I'd be happy to help them set it up. And he said, yeah, but you know what? It's pretty small potatoes relative to, to Ontario. So be careful what you wish for. Speaking of leanings, do you ever get accused of leaning uh, more to the left or to the right? Or I think it depends who's, um, who's, who's doing the accusing. Um, actually, surprisingly, not as much as I was expecting, because certainly in Ottawa, it was pretty, pretty vicious, a uh, whole bunch of reasons, um, some of which were self-inflicted wounds, some of which were just a product of having a succession of minority governments. <clears throat> but here, I think be, for two reasons. One is I sat, I got a front row seat to all, this, all the cool stuff that Kevin Page had to put up with. So I learned a lot from that. And here too, we have arguably a more mature relationship with the government. We consult with senior bureaucrats uh, as we're putting our stuff together to make sure we're getting our facts right. Uh, we rely on them for data. They have to provide it to us by law, but they give us all the data we need. We're entitled to cabinet documents here, which they aren't in Ottawa. Um, we, uh, and we also provide the minister in question a, a copy 48 hours in advance of release to allow his or her staff to prepare an appropriate response. So it's not a gotcha game. It's not, uh, there's none of that, which I think takes a lot of it. Like I said, we shed light, not heat. So it takes a lot of the heat out of it. That being said, as we get into an election, I am certain I will be accused by somebody somewhere on some side about something. And that's just part of the territory, right? That's the way it goes. Thank you. Again, if anybody has a question, check if your mic is muted. Unmute your mic. Um, Peter, just a, a question. Um, I work with a, a lot of marketing people in terms of taking their brand and, and promoting it. And one of the things that we had access to was data points as quoted by AC Nielsen. So if you get three or four different brands, they're all provided the same neutral database. And part of the um, part of the issue is writing the story using that database or points to get across your point in competition with other marketers. My question to you would be: do, do you, in your experience, does any storytelling on your data points to make a point come to surface for you? Can you remember some some uh, organization or person? that presented an argument using your data points that you were quite impressed with and, and pleasantly surprised? I remember, yeah, I, I, I don't, re I can't recall a specific instance, but to your point, uh, it's interesting with the AC Nielsen data. <clears throat> One of the things I did when I started was really put a lot of time and effort in beefing up the communication side of the office. There's this, um, sort of a, you know, uh, when you, I, I'm not a professional economist, I'm a finance guy and I have a political science degree and an, an MBA in finance and governance. So I'm not your typical economist where, and I don't want to, you know, I'm not trying to lay on economists, but, but often they're very focused on the work and not very much focused on getting the work out. And what I did is I tried to make sure we were able to get the work out and people are understanding and using and talking about it. So we've done a lot of work in tracking uh, so I have a small team that does that, um, which isn't really answering your question directly. Um, what I often see more of is folks using our work to buttress their own uh, advocacy work. So they, it's not always taken in context. What I do get sometimes impressed with is when I get, you know, I see citizens or whoever they are, maybe they're bots, but, but folks that are tweeting saying, no, the officer is is nonpartisan. No, these numbers are, are, are right. No, this is you know, um, these guys these guys are, are solid. There's not a 
it, not a discussion around calling them into question. That to me is important. Is that to me that's the brand? The brand is authoritative, um, nonpartisan, and um, <clears throat> accuracy is important. Uh, sometimes, sorry, timeliness is important. Sometimes it takes a, a backseat to accuracy. So, those are the things that I look for in terms of measuring uh, measuring the brand. Um, Thank you. On this, just to, to pick up on that, on this climate change piece. So I spent about a year and a half working with various experts in the field to let them know what we were doing and to get input. And the work that we've done here, uh, nobody else in the world has done. I did a presentation to this OECD working group for budget officers about a month ago, virtually, unfortunately, but maybe next time it'll be in, the, in Europe. Um, <clears throat> And uh, everybody else around the table had been, like the purpose of the meeting was, what can we do as budget offices to try to provide analysis and insight on the impacts of climate change on our fiscal situations? And we already done something. Right? We were the only ones that had actually done something. Um, so that was kind of exciting. And I know we're doing a presentation to the asset managers of Ontario at the end of the month because they're looking at this and this is a great tool for them. So there's a lot of that that's going to happen, and uh, and our work will get picked up. And that's we, you know, that, that to me is important. Is that the work? You know, it's public work. It's publicly funded, paid for by taxpayers of Ontario, and it should be widely available to be used and understood and applied by folks uh, wherever they are. Thank you. Peter, <clears throat> Peter, I. I heard you mention uh, tracking uh, a, a couple of minutes ago, and I was wondering, um, it occurred to me how much you, you pay attention to, I noticed there's a wide diversity in some cases between, between government budgets and your forecasts, and I wonder how much you track that over time. So are you referring to uh, our, like evaluating our forecasts and how, or, is that kind of what you mean or? Yeah, yeah. How does it compare over time uh, with what you forecast and what the budget or the government budgets and uh, do you do anything about that? Well, we know we're always right. So, <laughs> so no need, right? Um, we actually do <clears throat> internally, we haven't done it formally. That's a very good point you raise because um, it is something that we're talking about uh, and trying to figure out how to do it. I'm actually in touch with the OECD because we're, we're talking about them coming in and doing some sort of review and that might be incorporated into into that review as to how you know how accurate we've been and how consistent we've been but internally whenever we do like for example great example we did a piece on education spending a couple of years ago and we forecast enrollment and we forecast spending <clears throat> and we incorporated um, the government was trying to raise class sizes <clears throat> to reduce the number of teachers and they had a furlough program where they were basically over time weaning, te like retiring teachers early and giving them extra money to retire early. And it turned out at the end of the day, we had quite a lot of discussion with the ministry in terms of the forecast numbers. And they have better access to data than we do, right, obviously. Uh, and they were, they were critical of our forecast, of our enrollment forecast. And it turned out that we were right. <laughs> Once the, all the numbers came in and our forecast ended up being better than theirs. And that was a one-off. But we do do that sort of thing. There's a bit of internal competition. We try to, you know, say, okay, how close were we? And on, on the surgical procedures, we were pretty darn close. Um, so, but on a more formal basis, we're going to, we'll look at the fiscal forecast um, probably over the summer because once the election happens, we can't publish anything uh, by law. So we'll probably start to look at that, that sort of thing. But a good point to raise. Thank you. There's lots going on. <clears throat> it's been a tricky period being in COVID. I mean, I much prefer to do these in person, uh, but that's just not an option. Um, but it's still fun. It's still fun to do these. I encourage you to visit the website because there's a lot of different material. It covers a lot of different areas. And we're always open to ideas. So if you have something that you think, you've given me a couple already, and uh, happy to take those back and kick them around. Um, 
I know in this group, there are a lot of um, very experienced folks in all aspects of, of life in Ontario and always, always look forward to uh, any feedback or any thoughts that you may have. You can always shoot me a note. Um, there's a, you know, an email thing on the, on the site too. So always uh, receptive to that. If there's uh, no further questions, I will uh, turn it over to Duncan to thank our speaker for a nice presentation. Thank you. Peter, thank you very much. It was uh, quite interesting and informative. And as usual, I try and summarize at least one salient point that I took out of it on a personal basis. And uh, that salient point that I just wanted to share with you that caught my attention and reinforced a positive reaction to your presentation in, in many ways was, are there other ways, all right? That was the takeaway. And I think that the idea of all of these data points, all of this information going to um, various people, various interest groups and so forth, the one common thread or denominator over all of them is are there other ways? And that's what struck me and that was my takeaway. And as far as takeaway is concerned, um, uh, we hope that you will enjoy the takeaway that I'm going to mail you, which is the $30 LCBO <laughs> gift certificate. And that might bring warm thoughts to you in the cold Ottawa winters. Thank you. Thank you very much. Timing is good. It's about minus 34 here with the wind chill today. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>